Help us to be the people that you desire for us to be, to be more like Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. So one Sunday morning in July, I was stopped by one of our incredible First Impressions volunteers, and um, she told me that she has recently been doing a Bible study with, with a couple of friends, and that they've been going through the book of, of, of Romans, which, which is good, because if you're new here, we've been going through the book of Romans pretty much this entire year, and, and she, she said, she said, I, we, we just got to Romans 11, and I don't know quite what to make of it, and so... I can't wait for us to get to Romans 11 in our series as well. Well, here we are. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will help us grasp God's heart for God's people in this text. My prayer is that we will be challenged and that we will be filled with hope as we dive into this, this chapter, this, this part of this chapter that um, can be challenging in, in, in very real ways. Over the course of this year, as we've been studying Paul's letter to the Romans, there, there have been a, a few occasions that I've felt just completely inadequate to communicate the magnitude of what Paul is communicating to the Romans. One time was, I believe it was probably around chapter 6 or so, whenever Paul's talking about this idea of justification by, by, by grace through faith and, and just this whole idea that, that all of our sin and all of our shame and all of our, our, our brokenness, all of our, our shortcomings, all of them were, were placed on Jesus on the cross. And in, 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 in response to him taking on all of that, he gave us his his righteousness, meaning that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin or our shame or our brokenness. Instead, whenever he looks at us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus. It is literally the most lopsided trade in human history, but it's also the most beautiful exchange in human history. But I remember preparing for that week, and I, I vividly remember standing on this stage right in this general vicinity right here, just trying to do my best to communicate the, the, the significance of this gift, this grace that has been made available to us, and just wishing that somehow I had a grander vocabulary so I could try and communicate what I was feeling in my heart and in my soul, the magnitude of this life-changing truth. Well, this week has been another one of those weeks. As I was preparing on Tuesday, I was overwhelmed by the thought of God's sovereignty so I just sat there in my office for a couple of minutes and asked God to help me to understand the importance of his sovereignty. And I am so thankful for that moment, but, but man, I'll be honest, I still feel woefully inadequate to communicate it. But I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, and I'm relying on him to do what only he can do today. Because it's such a powerful thing to see how God has worked throughout history throughout the history of the world, to offer salvation to the world. And that's what we've been talking about the past several weeks here. Uh, God's sovereign plan through one nation to save all nations, and through one family to save all families. And over the past month, we, we've been working our way through Romans 9 through 11, a part of Romans that, that many, many times whenever people preach through Romans or something like that, they just gloss over this section of Scripture because it can be hard to understand. But throughout so much of Romans, Paul's pastor, pastor's heart has been shining, shining through. He has a deep desire for these people, for, 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 for all these Roman people, both Jews and Gentiles, to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But with that said, I don't know if there's a more personal part of this letter than Romans chapters 9 through 11. Since the beginning of chapter 9, Paul has been pouring out his heart in a sense pleading with his Jewish brothers and sisters, telling them just how badly that he, he, he wants them to turn to Jesus, but reminding them that from the very beginning of their story, from the very beginning of their story, from the time of Abraham, that there have always been two Israels, there have been the Israel who, who, have, who have staked claim, who have accepted the covenant that God made with his people. And then there are those who have not. And Paul's telling them that that is still true in his day. 
And then he's methodically worked through explaining God's sovereign plan of salvation over the course of these three chapters. In chapter 9, Paul says that God's sovereign plan has always worked this way. In chapter 10, he says that, that the plan has worked. And now in chapter 11, Paul is saying that the plan will keep on working. And so over the course of of these chapters, it is clear that Paul knows that there's been some tension in what he's saying because over and over again, he he says one thing that could be interpreted as God has given up on his people. But then over and over again, after he makes one of those statements, he would say something along the lines of this. Does that mean that God failed the Jews? Did God fail to keep his promises? Is God unfair in how he dispenses mercy? Is God unjust for holding people accountable for rejecting him? Or the question that we looked at at the beginning of last week as he kicked off chapter 11, did God reject his people? And in every situation, with every question, the answer has been the exact same. He has said, by no means, like absolutely not. God has not failed the Jews. God has not failed to keep his promises. God is not unfair in how he dispenses mercy. God is not unjust in in how he holds people accountable. And no, God did not reject his people. Okay, then what's going on here? Well, God's sovereign plan is at work. His sovereign plan to save all the nations through one nation and to save all families through one family. And that's what's happening here in chapters 9 through 11. Last week, we opened up with the question, did God fail the Jews? And Paul says, no, by, by, by no means, absolutely not. And here's why. Paul would say, because, because I'm a Jew. I'm from the line of Abraham, and I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, and and God is using me to bless the nations, and so no, God has not failed the Jews. And and, and then he talks about Elijah, and and he he talks about, about this remnant that has always been around, that even in Israel's most unfaithful times, there has always been a remnant of the true Israel to, to carry on God's promises. But those who do not belong to the true Israel, they have been hardened. So, to kick off our text this morning in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, Paul, he asks another question. He says, again, I ask, did they, these Israelites, did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. By no means. Those who have been hardened, did they stumble beyond recovery? Not at all. Why? Because God's grace is just too big. But instead, what we are going to see next is that there, Israel's stumbling. This is where it gets kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, complicated. Israel's stumbling was done to bring salvation to the Gentiles. That God, in his sovereignty, his complete control and authority, his all-powerful guiding governance to work in accordance with his perfect plan and purpose for this world, would use Israel's rebellion... To bring people to salvation of all people of all nations who would call on the name of Jesus. To fulfill the promise to Abraham and his family. But let's look at how Paul describes this in in Romans 11. Beginning in verse 11. We're going to go through verse 24 today. And I'm going to walk through this really, really slow. Okay? So uh, he's still in a sense answering the question that he asked in in 11.1. Like chapter 11 verse 1. Did God reject Israel? So that's still part of what he's talking about here. But he's also just continuing to answer the question. Again, I ask. Did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Because, here comes some purpose. Here comes some purpose why they did not fall beyond recovery. Because of their, Israel's, transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to, here's the other purpose, the the continual purpose, to make Israel envious. But if their, Israel's, transgressions means riches for the world, and and, 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 and their, Israel's, loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. That was a title that was given to the Apostle Paul. And he says that, that I take pride in that, in, in, in that ministry. And remember, the Roman church is a mix of Jewish and, and Gentile believers. But the majority at, at the time of Paul's writing of this letter 
were Gentile believers. So why does Paul take pride in this ministry? He takes pride in this ministry in the hope that I may somehow arise my own people, the Israelites, to envy and save some of them. For if their Israel's rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. But if some, if you have a physical Bible underlined, circle the word some there. But if some of the branches have been broken off, and, and he's talking about the Jewish branches. He's talking about, you know, the, the, these are Jewish branches. If some of these Jewish branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, Gentile branches have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. He says, do not consider yourselves to be superior to the other branches. If you do, if you consider yourself to be superior than than the Jewish branches who have been broken off, he says, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. He says, you Gentiles, We'll say then, branches were broken off so I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by, you have been grafted in by faith. So, do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if, you, if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jewish branches... He will not spare you Gentile branches either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you provided that, in other words, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they, Israel, do not persist in unbelief, they, Israel, will be grafted in. For God is able to grasp, to grasp them in again, all because of his amazing grace. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted in to a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Make sense? Man. But when you stop and consider the sovereignty of God, It is no wonder that God said to Isaiah in Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Randy Frazee and Max Lucado, they have a biblical summary book called The Story. And then they talk about how there's constantly these two stories that are taking place in, 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 in humanity and in the world around us and each of our lives. You have the lower story. You have the lower story. And this is the story that we can see and feel and touch and taste. And, and here it's what we experience. It's what we know. It's what we can largely understand and make sense of. But then you also have the upper story. And this is God's story. This is, this is where God operates. This is where his sovereign rule and reign plays out. And oftentimes we don't understand it. Oftentimes it doesn't make sense. But his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But as we read Romans 9 through 11, and, and in, in particular these closing paragraphs of chapter 11, it seems to me that Paul is doing his best to connect God's upper story to our lower story. He's helping us make sense of things that don't easily or naturally make sense. And so when looking at what Paul says here in Romans 11, 11 through 24, it seems that there are largely three ways that, that Paul seems to be highlighting God's sovereignty. And the first one is this. I believe that Paul is highlighting God's sovereign purpose. He's highlighting God's sovereign purpose. Again, to read to you, again, I ask, did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles so that Israel will become envious. 
But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am apostle to the Gentiles and I take pride in my ministry in hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if the rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance bring but life from the dead? And just with this sovereign purpose, there are three parts of the purpose that Paul is mentioning here. First, we have Israel's negative response to the gospel. Israel's negative response to the gospel following the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven. The apostles and the early church leaders, they they went out and they began preaching the message that Jesus, he was the resurrected Christ and he was God's Messiah. And many of the first people that that the early church fathers and the apostles went and preached to, many of them were their Jewish brothers and sisters. However, many of the Jewish brothers and sisters that they first preached that message to, they they failed to believe. They, they, They refused to respond to their message. And even with this small part, that, that, just that tiny part of Jewish history, you can see God's great sovereignty playing out. As I was studying this week, I came across an interesting question that, that I don't even know if I have a good feel of an answer for it, but one commentator asked, what would have happened if the majority of the early apostles, Jewish brothers and sisters, would have responded to the message that the resurrected Jesus was truly God's Messiah? Is it possible that if they had responded to that message, that the, that the early church fathers and the apostles would have been satisfied with that result? And therefore, they would not have been as passionate to continue to spread the message to, gen- to a Gentile audience who was more ready to receive. And I don't know if I have a good answer for this, but in God's sovereignty, his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. The second part of this is is the Gentiles' passion for God is used to make Israel jealous of their relationship with God. So the Jews, they see the Gentiles' passion and worship, and in doing so, they see something that they want to experience for themselves. And then the third part is that eventually Israel comes back to God. Again, because of God's amazing grace, their story is not over. There is a worldwide gospel movement that is still to come. When even their own, the Israelites' own rejection, it not only blessed the nations, but it also will be a blessing to their own people. The second way that Paul highlights God's sovereignty here is through a sovereign history. Paul, he talks about an olive shoot, saying that if the roots of the olive shoot are holy, then the branches are holy. The faith of all Jesus' followers comes from very Jewish roots. One God calling one family to become one nation, to bless all families, and to bless all nations. And as Paul has been talking throughout Romans 9 through 11, even in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there were two Israels, meaning that there have always been Jewish or natural branches on the olive shoot, but there have also been Jewish branches or natural branches that have failed to take part in the covenant that God made with his people. And to those natural branches who have failed to take part in the covenant, they have been cut off. And unnatural branches, Gentile branches, have been grafted in. And if you want to hear Jesus, how he would explain this, you can go to Matthew chapter 21 and read the parable of the tenants. Or you can go to Matthew chapter 22 and and read the parable of the wedding banquet, banquet. But essentially Paul, or excuse me, Jesus is talking about Israel And he says, you have been called, but you have not responded. So now we are going to go to those who will respond. And here's how Paul puts it in verses 17 through 21. He says, if some of the branches have been broken off, these Jewish branches, and you, though a wild olive shoot, Gentile branches have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those branches. If you do, consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You, you, you will say then, branches were broken off so I could be grafted in. Granted, that's all out of God's amazing grace. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. So do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. 
And that leads us to the third way that, God, that, that Paul highlights God's sovereignty here. He, he highlights it with a sovereign, hopeful warning. A sovereign, hopeful warning. Paul has said, do not be arrogant. Hey, Gentiles, do not look down on non-believing Jews. You are no better than them. They were broken off because they do not believe. You were grafted in because you did believe. So don't be arrogant, but tremble. In verse 22, he says, Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that or if you continue in his kindness. If you do not continue in his kindness you also will be cut off. So church, don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is a warning. A question that gets asked a lot is this. Can someone lose their salvation? You ever asked that question? You ever heard that question asked? I've had pretty much the same answer for probably the last 15 years or so. And that answer is this, that no, you cannot just lose your salvation. You will not lose your salvation the way that you lose your car keys. You will not lose your salvation the way that you lose your wallet. It's not that your salvation is there one minute and then the next minute it's just gone. We remember just a couple of chapters ago, it was in this same letter to these same people that the Apostle Paul said that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It was in the same letter, I mean, literally just, just a couple of chapters ago whenever the Apostle Paul says that, that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's not too far removed from Romans 7, but... But it's clear that Paul is trying to make us understand that there is a tension here. So no, I do not believe that you can just lose your salvation. But I do believe that you can divorce Christ. I do believe that you can decide that you can choose to sever your relationship with Jesus. And I do believe that's what Paul is warning us of here. It's not that a single mistake or a couple of dumb decisions or a season of sin is going to cause you to lose your salvation. And that's all because of God's kindness and grace and certainly not something that we deserve. However, if the mistake or the dumb decision or the seasons of sin remain unrepentant and unacknowledged in our lives, then our hearts are going to continue to become harder and harder and harder, and then you are going to move further and further and further from Jesus. And I don't know where that line is. I, I would believe that as long as we're asking the question, are we too far gone, there's a really good chance that we're probably not too far gone. But I also would say that if you're trying to figure out where the line is of where do I lose my salvation and where do I not, then you're trying to figure out the wrong thing. Because the goal is not to get as close to the line as possible while remaining okay. The goal is to consider God's sternness while also not missing out on his kindness. Again, this is a warning, but it is a hopeful warning. This is how Paul puts it. Maybe some of you will remember this from Romans chapter 2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? If I could encourage you all with one thing today, it would be this to be moved by his kindness, to be moved by his grace. Don't become arrogant believing that you deserve God's gift of salvation, but remain grateful that through his sovereign plan, he has made a way for you. Don't be arrogant, but tremble. Recognize God's power. 
submit to his sovereign reign, to the fact that he's got the whole world in his hands and that his thoughts are greater than your thoughts and his ways are greater than your ways. Paul, he gives us a sovereign warning, but it really is a hopeful warning. And as we will see next week, this hopeful warning is meant to lead us to worship. Because the greatest example of God's sovereign reign, of him proving that his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours, is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The worst thing to ever happen happened to the best person to ever live. And it was the best thing to ever happen to the worst of us that has ever been. Through Jesus, our Jewish Savior and Messiah, from the family of Abraham, all nations were blessed through one nation and all families were blessed through one family and salvation was made available to all. It's amazing, church. His thoughts really are higher than our thoughts and his ways really are greater than our ways. And today, may we just simply give thanks that they are. Will you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you for, for this text. I mean, it has been a joy to be able to dig into this here lately. And Father, I am just so humbled by your sovereign plan. The way that the Apostle Paul was able to articulate all of it and make sense of all of it. And I know that it's a lot to try and digest and I know that it's a lot to try and, and take a hold of, but, but God, I thank you and so I pray today that we, will, that we will surrender to you, that we will surrender to your sovereignty and, and to your graciousness. And that we, will, that we will acknowledge and that we will be so grateful for your kindness, but we won't overlook your sternness. And that we won't try and get rid of that tension, but that we will find ourselves living in the middle of that tension. So thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made to make us right with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Right now, we're going to